And welcome to worship here at Bethlehem Lutheran Church. We are glad that you are joining us today. Whether you are physically here in your pew or whether you are joining us remotely online, we are glad that you are with us because this is a place where you can bring your full self, good and bad, because this is a place that emphasizes God's grace, mercy, compassion, and love. The first reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 9 through 14 on page 173 in the Old Testament. Moses calls the people who are about to enter the promised land to renew the covenant God made with their ancestors. Through this covenant, God gives life and asks for obedience. God's commandment is neither burdensome nor too far off, but dwells in the people's own hearts. The reading begins at verse nine. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all your undertakings, in the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your soil. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you, just as he delighted in prospering your ancestors, when you obey the Lord your God by observing his commandments and decrees that are written in this book of the law, because you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Surely this commandment that I am commanding you today is not too hard for you, nor is it too far away. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross to the other side of the sea for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it. No, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and your heart for you to observe. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, on page 176 in the New Testament. The letter to the Colossians was written to warn its readers of various false teachings. The first part of the letter is an expression of thanks for the faith, hope, and love that marked this community, including a prayer for strength and courage from Paul. The reading begins at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth the gospel that it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learned from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you, and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel for this morning is from the 10th chapter of Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? 
He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers, who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three, do you think, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go, and do likewise. The word of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Dear friends in Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God, our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A few years ago in November, I called a special 1-800 number for federal campgrounds. Nothing was computerized back then. That was 1858 that I called. And <laughs> And I got the special number, and I asked if I could please reserve a camping spot for Cross Lake, Minnesota, July 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. I gave the lady my credit card number. Yes, there was still available a nice shady spot right down by the lake. So dreams of cool air and fireworks and barbecue with the family. It will be a great time dreaming of that in November. So... July came, and we pulled our small pop-up camper to Brainerd. We headed north, got up to the campground, put all the equipment up, had a campfire, had some goodies, got into my sleeping bag, heard loons, and I thought, does it get any better than this? What could go wrong? Then at 2.30 a.m., people arrived late, 2.30 a.m., started slamming doors, slamming trunks, talking, laughing, smashing tent poles together until they got tired. And then they went to sleep. It was four o'clock in the morning. And I thought to myself, I can really lose my Christianity at 2.30 in the morning. How rude these people are. Who do they think they are? Do they know who I am? I came up here for peace and some quiet, not to listen to you all night. I could really lose my Christianity at 2.30. For at that time, I don't really care who my neighbor is, as long as he's quiet. At 2.30, I'm not a good Samaritan. We didn't stay the evening of the 4th. I found out fireworks that year will be on the 7th of July. Isn't that funny? And besides, I didn't really want to lose another night's sleep. The plans I had in November really didn't turn out so well in July. But it made me well aware of my human nature at 2.30 in the morning. That would never happen to you, would it? The curfew hour, let's imagine the curfew hour for your teenager is 11 o'clock. Okay, 12. 12.30. One o'clock. One o'clock comes and you are quickly losing your Christianity. 
Or the baby is awake for the sixth time, and it's 3 a.m., and you need to be up by 6 a.m. to get to work, quickly losing Christianity. It's a test at times, isn't it? The life of faith, to love thy neighbor. Oh, by the way, who is my neighbor? The lesson for this morning starts out that way. A lawyer, who should know all the answers, a lawyer stands up to test Jesus, the word test, test Jesus. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And we find out quickly that this lawyer knows the commandments. He knows he must love the Lord his God with all of his heart and all of his soul and all of his mind as strength as well as his neighbor as himself. Jesus tells him that if you keep these commandments, you shall live which prompts another question from the lawyer. Oh, who is my neighbor? He's probably thinking to himself, Jesus better not say the Greeks or the Romans or the Syrians. Oh, and especially the Samaritans. They can't be my neighbor. They have all come into this land, every one of them, and they've occupied it in a different way. Who is my neighbor? And true to form, Jesus does not give the lawyer a straight answer. Instead, he tells him a story about the parable of the Good Samaritan. That phrase has lasted a long time, hasn't it? Good Samaritan. Drive across our area, across America, and you can see Good Samaritan counseling centers, Good Samaritan hospitals. Years ago, I even joined a travel club called the Good Sam Club, picturing a little guy with a halo on his head. The word good is not mentioned in the story today, but it is the story of a man who reached out with love for his neighbor. Mark Twain once wrote, kindness is the language that the deaf can hear and that the blind can read. And he was right. Everyone can understand the language of love. And the Samaritan was good because he spoke the language of love. The story begins with a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and lots and lots of people knew this was a dangerous area where robbers would hide behind large rocks and they would stop people along the way, rob them, beat them up, or even worse. The journey between Jerusalem and Jericho was just 17 miles. But to get there, you had to travel through the wilderness and probably linger on the road between Jerusalem and Jericho. That was a very dangerous area. Pastor Frank Lyman in a sermon on this story, it says here, within this story, we see three philosophies of life. First, the robber. He comes along and his philosophy is, whoop, and thank you. Let's give Chad a hand, huh? <laughs> and the first philosophy is, what's yours is mine. If I see something that's yours, I'm going to take it and then it's going to be mine. What's yours is going to be mine. Next comes by chance a priest going down the road and when he saw the man beaten up he passes by on the other side and the second philosophy is what's mine is mine. If it's mine I'm going to keep it. The first one, what's yours is mine. The second is, what's mine is mine. Leave me alone, please. And the religious man passes by for two reasons. We think number one reason was if, if he gets within six feet of this beat up man, and he is a good Jew, he would be ceremonially unclean. He needs to go back up 17 miles, good luck with that, 17 miles back up to the temple to get a ritual cleansing. The second reason we think he avoided the man was because they were hypocrites. 
No one's going to see you on the road between Jerusalem and Jericho. No one will know that you passed by on the other side. No one will judge you for what they don't see. Your job is secure. No one will see what you're doing. You can take that item at work, and, or you could be immoral and on and on, as long as you're not caught. This is what was happening to the priest, to the Levite, and of course, many people. The religion of the other side, walk by. The religion of non-involvement. The religion of pass by on the other side. The priest and the Levite, they walk by. What is mine is mine. I have no time for some half-dead nobody lying on the road. What's mine is mine. What's yours is mine. And then there's a third philosophy. What's mine is yours. The Samaritan comes along and he's despised by the Jews. These Samaritans intermingled with foreigners. They mixed with heathen. They lived apart from other Jews. They didn't even worship at Jerusalem. But the Samaritan sees the man. He doesn't pass by. He stops. He cleanses the man's wounds with wine. He binds the wounds with cloth. He wasn't carrying band-aids with him or things like that. He ripped pieces of his own robe and bandaged the man. He takes him to an inn and he pays for the man's recuperation. But imagine for a moment, you are the man in the ditch. You are the one bleeding, beaten up. You can't hardly see out of your eyes. Pain racks your body. You hear somebody coming along. Oh, the third person is coming now. And this person stops and you look up and I think you might have said, no, 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 anyone but a Samaritan. Now I'm dead for sure. A Samaritan, what luck I'm having today. Can things get any worse? I am dead now for sure. But the Samaritan kneels down and begins to talk. Friend, where does it hurt? Don't move. I'll get some oil from you. You can mount up on my animal. I'll get you to the inn. You can get rest and healing. Don't worry about the expense. I'll pay everything later. Three philosophies. What's yours is mine. What's mine is mine. And now what's mine is yours. Often in life, the one philosophy is every man for himself. But the lesson this morning tells us to slow down for a moment and pause, ponder the story a little bit more deeply. For you and I are not the robber. We're not the priest. We're not the good Samaritan. You and I are lying in the ditch. And Christ comes along in grace and rescues us. He is the one who gives us the wine to heal our wounds, the bread to forgive our sins. He is the one who stops and gives us life. He has the body broken for us. We're no longer broken, but his body is broken to heal us. This story is the action of God in Christ, grace upon grace upon grace. As it's said in the second lesson from Colossians, Christ has delivered us, he's rescued us. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of love in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. He rescued us from the ditch and we are healed. We get back up on our feet to pass on acts of healing and grace to others. What's yours is mine. What's mine is mine. But what mine is mine is yours. And thank God, a fourth philosophy. What is God's grace, life, and forgiveness is yours. 
The one who shows mercy is the good neighbor. Freely we receive, freely we give. Grace is never deserved. Today we call it gospel, good news, go and do likewise. Let us pray. God of the cross, you gave your very life, emptying yourself freely for us, for the whole world to break down the barriers of sin that separate us. Strengthen our faith so we may lay down prejudice and judgment, and having received mercy, may we be merciful. Amen.